My name is Tom Valdeseri. I'm Executive Vice President of Kepler Lesnick here in Chicago. And in addition to events like this, you know, every day we get to come into work and do some really, really fun things. Uh, we get to create great ideas for clients and events that drive results. Uh, engage fans, brands, and uh, customers. And we do that with sports marketing, experiential marketing, branded content, PR, social, and on and on. We uh, work with chefs, celebrity chefs, every year to bring them to the KitchenAid Senior PGA Championship, uh, which is a really fun event to do. We were the first to bring a virtual reality tour to the sport of NASCAR for McDonald's. Uh, we brought the LPGA players in town and uh, conducted a target practice uh, event with a floating green right here on the Chicago River. And we brought uh, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, Tom Watson, and Johnny Miller together for a branded special event uh, broadcast as part of CBS's Masters uh, broadcast. So a lot of fun and a lot of great results. Uh, and we do one more thing. We live stream podcasts, so smile for the camera. <laughs> All right, so our next guest is a prolific writer, reporter, and journalist. He's appeared on ESPN. He's a senior writer for Bleacher Report and their NBA coverage. He's a regular on the Mad Dog Show on Sirius XM. Please welcome Rick Buecher and Buecher and Friends. for joining us. Thank you to Kep Kemper Lesnick for putting on a, uh, a great event. And uh, I hope lunch was good. Yes, thumbs yeah. up. Yeah. All right, very good. Uh -huh. um, obviously, this is All-Star Weekend. And as has been mentioned in the, thank you, probably should use the microphone. <laughs> can You can tell I'm a professional, right? <laughs> um, with All-Star Weekend, obviously, there's going to be a lot done around uh, Kobe Bryant. And uh, in memory of him and uh, having just lost him. And I wanted to do, if you would, I'd, I'd like you to join with me and just take a minute, uh, not, not even a minute, just take a second, uh, close your eyes and think of someone that you love and that is not here right now with you uh, and give them that virtual hug. So let's just take a second and all. Uh, do that together, if you will, in the memory and the honor of Kobe. Thank you. All right. I am uh, so pleased to introduce, you know him, two-time dunk champion, uh, soon-to-be three-point champion, we're assuming, <laughs> uh, the face of the Chicago Bulls, Zach Levine. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so speaking of Kobe, he obviously had a big impact on you, meant a lot to you. You're, you're, you've had a unique experience that no one else in the room can, yeah. uh, can speak about, which is being on the floor and competing with him. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Man, so, uh, you know, Kobe meant so much to all of us. Uh, he was... I'm 24, so he was like our, you know, generation's Michael Jordan. Um, I was my idol growing up. Um, I have a couple of stories, but I mean, the main one I remember is was like my, like tenth game my rookie year. I'm not even starting yet. Um, I'm at Staples Center. Um, I'm playing him, and I'm having like a really good game. Like I'm, I have like 28 points going into the fourth quarter. Um, it's like the first big game of my rookie year, and come out into the fourth quarter and Kobe's guarding me um and, you know and I haven't I didn't touch the ball he's denying me he's playing me hard um and there's an out of bounds play and it was just like a breakage in time and uh I'm at the free throw line he comes up and he hits me on the butt says keep going young fella and it was just like a surreal moment to me because you know you're competing and you're not really into you know oh this is Kobe it's my idol but it made me just take a step back and I was like wow like this is like surreal to me so um you know, he meant, to, he meant so much to the game, and, you know, he's, he's going to truly be missed. Yeah. What is it that you will take from your experience with him or when you think about him? Mm -hmm. What will you take going forward? I mean, the main thing with me is what I took from him is his, 
his work ethic and his mentality. You know, everybody talks about, you know, all the shots and the dunks and, you know, how obviously how good he is and you want to take his parts of his game. But, um, you know, the thing that, that's helped me, you know, get to this point even growing up is just learning about his hard work and his, you know, his mental approach. Um, you know, I, I, you know, pat myself on the back. I always try to be the hardest worker, you know, wherever I go, um, you know, on the team and the NBA. I want to outwork everybody in the summer. So, you know, that's something that's going to stick with me forever. Your father, uh, Paul Levine, mm -hmm. professional football player, mm -hmm. played a little bit in the NFL, yeah. played in the USFL. Mm -hmm. How much did having a dad who had been a professional athlete before you uh, shape or influence the way you've approached your career? Man, uh, you know, that's like my best friend. and it's uh, He pretty much just paved the way for me. It was, um, you know, not a lot of kids, you know, you're lucky to, you know, have that type of influence in your life, um, and not everybody has that, you know. So, you know, I'm appreciative of it. But, you know, for somebody that's played the sport, and he pretty much, you know, guided me to do all the things that he did wrong. You know, he he grew up in a single family home, and he's, you know, he he put me on the path. I was doing interviews in the car when I was in third grade. You know, coming home from like basketball games, he pretend to put a mic in my face. You know, so. He, he, and at the time I didn't understand, you know, and I was in third grade, I was before I do in-house games, I was going to shoot a hundred shots before, before the game, you know, afterwards I had a routine, I had to write down a book, you know, all the shots I took. So, you know, he was preparing me for this time and I didn't even know it, you know, it's, well, you know, I got to thank him, you know, for everything. So did he make it overt that he saw you as a future professional athlete or was it just, he was preparing you based on his experience as a professional athlete. I mean, how much how much was that this this sense that this is what you were supposed to grow up to be? It, the it, it was always he said it was always a plan for me to, you know, he wanted me to be a professional athlete. He said it was going to be for me to put the hard work in and to make it happen. But he was going to put the steps in there for me to do it. And I think he also was cleaning up for the things that he didn't do as a professional athlete. You know. Um, you know, like you, you said, he played two years in the USFL. You know, for people who don't know, I didn't even know in the 80s. It was like another, you know, NFL. <laughs> it was another NFL league. Um, he folded on. And then he played for the Seahawks. I grew up in Seattle. He played for the Seahawks for a couple of years. He went to the Green Bay Packers. He broke his foot, and then that ended that. So, um, you know, he said, he said, I was a, you know, a great, great athlete. He was 6'4", six, uh, six about 250. He ran a 4'4", four four, played outside linebacker. Um, but he said I didn't. He said I didn't watch film. He said I, you know, I used to chase girls. I, you know, I went to the club, things like that. He said, you know, and that's why I didn't have somebody to tell me the right things to do. Um, yeah. You know, he, and I, you know, he made sure I didn't, you know, do those things. When did you know that you were bouncier than the average person? Bouncier? Wow. <laughs> What's crazy is I wasn't even. Uh, I was. I was always been a really good athlete, but when I was younger, I was. I was really small. That's why I played point guard. You know, pretty much growing up, and I was like. I wasn't even six foot going into high school. I grew I grew to six three my senior year, my six four. But um, when I finally grew uh, to about six four, I started dunking a lot in games. The first time I dunked, I was five eight. So that's you know that's when I realized I could jump pretty high. But <laughs> <laughs> I dunked when I was five eight, but five eight five nine. But then when I grew to about six three six four, that's when I realized you know. It was a, uh, it was a little bit different. <laughs> okay, so paint the picture for us. You're five eight. Wh where did this dunk occur, and who did it occur on? It, and it was, um, it was in like a jamboree game. I was playing um, the summer ball with the high school team. Um, so it was like a little open gym. Um, not open gym. It was a game, but got a steal. I went up for a layup with my left hand. I just was high enough and threw it in the hoop. Um, I was surprised. I didn't dunk again for another year. Actually, I didn't dunk again until I was in ninth grade. Um, because I really didn't know what I did. It was just, you know, a spur of the moment type thing. And, uh, you know, I remember my dad, I was looking at my dad in the crowd, and he was just, like, perplexed. So it was <laughs> it was kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to belabor this because I feel as if you've made a concerted effort to shape the view of you as being more than just an athlete mm. or a dunker. So, yeah. but, but I, I think the room can share this with me, like, seeing you do some of the things that you physically do, like just that verticality and what it's like to be up there. I mean, have you ever, have you ever jumped, have you ever taken off and you're like, I am way up here, like, yeah. <laughs> look where I am. Yeah, no, it's, um, 
Yeah. You know, it's a special it's a special skill and not everybody gets to have that, you know, no. and I can definitely take advantage of it in the game and um you know, I'm thankful for obviously I worked on it, you know, I in the work in the summer I do a lot a lot of workouts. Um you know, when I was younger I used to do lunges on the field, you know, to the hundred yard line and then backwards. And then to the eighty yard line and backwards. So that definitely, you know, helped. But uh Hmm. Yeah, there's a couple times, you know, like in the dunk contest, the first, the second time I won, like I never tried that between the legs from the free throw before. That was the first time I did it, first time I made it. So that was pretty much the, the that was one of the times I was like, wow, like this is, uh, <laughs> this is special. <laughs> <laughs> so did you just think of it in the moment? Did you have it in your head? Like how do, how do you come to t- attempting a dunk in the dunk contest that you've never done before? Oh, um, I just wanted to end it, you know. We were we were <laughs> we were going at it back and forth. Me and Aaron were going at it back and forth, and um, you know, I was like, it was, we both had spectacular dunks, and it was all right. in my head. I was like, it's probably the best dunk contest ever, and I just wanted to do something that's never been done before. And I'm either going to win or I'm gonna lose with this, but I'm gonna go out swinging. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, switching back a little bit to your to your dad, we talked. You talked a lot about how he prepared you in how to prepare as an athlete. You also seem to be very purposeful when it comes to what you do off the court. Mm -hmm. How much did you learn from him, whether by trial and error, what he didn't do, what he didn't realize he could do? How much did you learn about the the business of being a professional athlete from him? Um, You know, that's something that comes with experience as well, like learning experiences. Um, You know, going into the NBA at 19, you have to grow up fast. Um, you're in a you're in a uh, sport with a bunch of you know grown men. They have children, and you know you're you're looked as a, at as an adult, as a teenager. Um, mm-hmm. So there's not a lot of room for error in that, and you almost have to like fake it until you become that person. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, growing up, like I said, it was it was things that you know he prepared me for. But I feel like that was something that I went through on my own, and you know my parents were with me every step of the way, especially when I was in Minnesota and doing those different, uh, you know, those things growing up in the NBA as a teenager. But um, I feel like those are more learning experiences to where you learn how you, you know, how you have to act on and off the floor. Hmm. We always talk about the father-son equation. I don't want to lose mom yeah. in, the, in the mix. Yeah. What was her influence? My mom, my mom was pretty much the, our rock. Um, you know, she worked two jobs for seven years to be able to, you know, allow me to do these AAU tournaments, you know, wear these shoes and, you know, go to these camps and things like that. Um, you know, without a day off, my dad was the one who was spending a lot of time with me. She took the back seat and the, pretty much the brunt of it, you know, had to deal with, you know, me and my dad, you know, my no, not deal with me and my dad yelling at each other because it wasn't a lot of me yelling back, but, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, she had to deal with, you know. It, it Probably was, your hurt feelings from being yeah, yelled you know, at. Yeah, right? you know, I'll go to mom and, you know, she'd have to console me and be like, no, this is what we're doing and things like that. She had to be really tough and, you know, she was definitely the rock and, um, you know, I feel like the person that, you know, I, I am today is a lot because of her because she's so kind and, um, you know, she taught me, you know, almost how to, you know, become, a, you know, a good young man. Hmm. How, were there players, were there veteran players when you first came into the league that either helped you or counseled you or that you emulated? Um, so when I first got to the Timberwolves, it was an extremely vet team. We had... You know, one of my one of my good friends on the team now, Thaddeus Young, was in his like seventh or eighth year. Kevin Martin, Mo Williams. Um, but the biggest one was when we traded for Kevin Garnett. You know, he was the best teammate I've ever had. You know, and you know I had a story. I I tell everybody. I remember I was an extremely hard worker, so I went to the gym late um, at like eight thirty or nine o'clock on one of the off days. First thing now, I, I found a little weird. There was like a Rolls Royce Phantom out there, and it was like, I don't know anybody driving that, you know, on the team. So, who is this? Uh, <laughs> curtains are in the back and everything, so it was kind of cool. I looked at the car for like five minutes, went up to the practice facility. I see Kevin Garnett in a full sweat, doing sprints, you know, up and down the floor. And that was the first time I was like, man, it's a future Hall of Famer at 40. He doesn't have to be doing this, and it was, it was eye opening. He was a uh, he was a big part of my rookie year, you know, teaching me the ropes. Was he still, I don't want to say crazy. Um, yeah, no, he was, it, yeah, he's crazy. Though. <laughs> yeah, he's good crazy, but he's but, crazy. But, but, I mean, wildly intense. Yeah, yeah. And he still had that 
at 40, even with his interaction with you and the team and everybody else? So it was every practice was on 10. You know, it was at the max. And, you know, he, he elevated everybody. Even when he didn't play, you could hear him, you know, on the sideline calling out defensive coverages on the other side of the court. So yeah. he, he was the best teammate I've had. What do you make of his TV career? I mean, he's good, man. You know, especially with the little cuss button and everything. I think he's, I think he's really good. You know, KG is a, he's a character. How do you go about making important decisions? What, what, who do you, who do you lean on? What's your process when you've got to, you got to make a big decision? Uh, I mean, first off, I, like I said, I'm a family person. So I talk to my family. I still talk to my dad and take advice from my mom and dad. Um, you know, I talked to my girlfriend, my girlfriend for eight years. I talked to her about a lot of things. Um, and then I, I evaluate, you know, what's the pros and cons about it. You know, almost try to figure out, uh, is it benefiting me or am I doing this for a reason? Um, hmm. And, is, you know, is it worth my time? Right. Yeah. So when it comes to, uh, I'm sure you get approached all the time, business relationships, business ventures, what is it that you look for? What appeals to you? What's the thing that piques your interest in? This is something that I'd like to do, or this is something that I think would be valuable for me to participate in. I think the first thing is you have to look at, like I said, is it worth your time? Um, and is it something that you're doing to be interested in? You know, because if, if you don't be faking it or if you're doing it for, you know, a reason that's not, you know, true to you, you know, obviously people will do things for money and, you know, things like that. But if it's not true to you, I feel like people can see through it. Um, so I obviously want to go at it about, you know, is it something I want to do? Um, obviously, is it worth my time? Is it valuable? Um, and how can it, you know, affect me later on? Yeah. So making it monetary is not the primary focus for you. Like, what am I going to get out of this financially? Yeah, no, not because, you know, I'm in a different situation than a lot of people. Obviously, I'm a professional athlete. I don't have to look at it money-based as of right now. Right. So, you know, I want to build relationships also. Are there things in particular that inspire you? Like when you think about things that you have a passion for, what are those things that you'd like to get into? I'm, I'm simple, you know. Um, you know, I'm still 24, so, you know, uh, you know, I like – it was just going to sound crazy that I'm – I'm really big into video games, but video games is taking over, like, almost all of, like, media, you know, on online and things like that. There's Twitch, um, Mixer, different things like that. So I'm trying to go into that route because I already do this stuff, you know, a lot because I'm just at the house playing video games in my spare time. Um, you know, see if I can dive into that, you know, genre a little bit more. Right. Um, so... Um, in making a decision, I, I feel as if you have a lot of uh, advisors that you open yourself up to a lot of, of input from other people. Mm. How do you determine who you're going to trust? I, I, this comes up in my conversations with athletes all the time because yeah. they go from necessarily not a whole lot of business experience, not a whole lot of money, to suddenly jumping into it, yeah. extreme wealth, yeah. people extremely interested in partnering with you and figuring out who you can who you can successfully partner with like how do you go about figuring out this is someone that I'm, I'm willing to go into business with and sometimes you need help with it too so you have to go seek you know some professionals who are good at their job and are are, are meant to do that so obviously I have a financial team um, you know and I talk to them about a lot of things um, but then also is it like why is this person talking to me is he talking to me because he wants to help me or is it Oh, this is Zach Levine, a basketball player. I can take advantage of him. I see that he's a young kid. He's 19. He doesn't know a lot about this. Hmm. Let me see if I can talk him into it. You know, so, you know, I'm obviously, you know, I'm, I'm happy I can, you know, obviously talk for myself and stand up for myself. But sometimes it's hard to see through that. And sure. learning experience is sometimes the best teacher as well. So, um, you know, you have to go through those trials um, and then, you know, hopefully you make those right decisions. But, you know, like I said, experience is always the best teacher. Um, and I always fall back on my dad with, you know, my, my, my parents is, you know, is this a good idea? Is this not? Um, I talk to my financial team. And, and sometimes you can try to just read the person and see through, uh, for who they are. I'll be honest. When I first came to know who Zach Levine was, and it was obviously off of, largely off of the dunk contests, yeah. off of, 
just your your great athleticism, I probably put you in a box like many people do. Oh, that's what he is. Like he's oh, he's a great dunker. He's a great leaper. I've got I had a chance to get to know you, and I know that there's there's much more to you than that. What do you think is? I, I, First of all, have you are you aware of that? Like that that was a perception or perspective on you that you had to change or that you had to confront. I understood it, but it didn't it didn't bug me because I understood where it came from. You know, even at you know at nineteen twenty, I understood. You know, NBA is driven by social media, and it, it's in the media it can portray you in a different way. Uh, I played with the Minnesota Timberwolves. We won about 20 games a year for the first two years. We weren't on a lot of ESPN games. We weren't getting put out there. We weren't making the playoffs. So the one time that fans get to see you or casual fans get to see you is in the dunk contest. So that's going to be their one picture of you. Mm-hmm. They're not going to see you putting the hard work in, you know, spending four hours working on your moves. They're not going to see you, you know, get your 25 points this night on all jump shots. You know, it's they're not going to see that. They're going to see a dunk contest. And it's not, it's not, that doesn't bug me. You know, we do this for the fans. And, you know, I went out there, I wanted to put a show on. But um, I didn't let that stop me and, you know, or even try to, you know, make that narrative because I knew who I was. I know the type of work I put in. And, um, you know, eventually that stuff comes to light. I found it interesting. I, I hope this story is true, that when you were growing up, that your dad was actually putting you through the three-point contest on accident, in your yeah. back yeah. in your backyard yeah. right that, yeah. I mean that's that's where it started it didn't start with dunking it started with yeah. the event that you're going to be in Saturday night yeah so I used to uh you know I, I grew up middle class I didn't we didn't have a whole lot of money so we used to go to the Goodwills and the thrift stores and my dad pretty ingenious about this we used to buy the you know the big swimming pools the plastic ones and buy about three of them I had a backyard with a hoop and we went to all the thrift stores and we grabbed probably all the basketballs we could out of like five stores. We spent like all day going to the stores. Um, and he put the balls in the buckets. And, you know, there's probably about 60 in, you know, 20 in each one. Okay. Um, and then when he, so he would go to work that day, you know, during the day. Um, so when I would come home from school, he wouldn't be back. So I would be able, when I go get home, I could go shoot all the balls in the bucket 20 at a time. So I didn't have to have a rebounder. So I would shoot 20, go to the next one, shoot 20, go to the next one, shoot 20 put them all back in. I would do that multiple times. So it was almost like a three-point competition type thing. I would write down how many I made, um, and I would do that till he got home, and then we would uh, do something else. What Describe the back. Uh, this is in Renton? Uh, no, this was in Bothell. Yeah, I moved, okay, in, Bothell, I, moved okay. into a, I moved into my grandma's house. My grandma got sick, and we moved in with her. Okay. Um, and she had a court in the back. So describe this 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 court. Um, it was... Uh, so in Seattle, there's a lot of trees. So obviously, um, you know, it's it's green, beautiful place. But my backyard, I had a little bit of cement in the backyard, um, decent amount of yard. But um, we we nailed a hoop to the, um, it was a tree that sat in front. We didn't even have like a real hoop, but we nailed like a, my dad bought a rim at the, at the Goodwill and nailed it to the tree and made a backboard. Um, and I thought it was the best thing. It had like a chain net, so when you swish it, you hear it. Um, so that's what I shot on. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! Yeah. I think everybody can can yeah. relate to that. That's fun. Yeah. That vision. Yeah. Uh, what What is your favorite memory of just those days playing back then? Just how free it was, and you know, I remember, you know, coming home from school, and I wasn't some. I wasn't a really. Uh, you know, I wasn't in the parties. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have too many friends. A couple of my friends, one of my one of my best friends actually lived with me. Um, he had a tough situation with his family, and my, my, my family took him in, so we, he's pretty much like my brother. But, um, you know, I had, like, like a goal in my hand, in my head, like, every day. Like, I wasn't worried about outside things. I would come home, and I had a routine, and I got my shots up. I would go back to practice. I would work out. Um, but it was something that I wanted to do. It wasn't forced. Um, hmm. I just remember how, you know, how much of an urge I had to. I wanted to just get to my goal. Um, so that was the only thing on my mind. How much uh, playing in the rain did you do up there? Man, I used to have so many gloves. Like, <laughs> I could, it was because it's wet. Seattle, you know, it, it didn't look like this outside. So you shooting gloves? Yeah, just you know, with gloves. Um, you know, because if it get too wet, you know, obviously yeah. hands freeze yeah. or whatever. But um, yeah, it was. Uh, 
I was outside a lot. Sometimes when it rains here, I you know I enjoy it. I like I remember the smell of it. Hmm. The you are in the three point contest Saturday night. Uh, I know there's probably people that were hoping, this being in Chicago, et cetera, that you were going to be in the dunk contest. What made you decide this is what I wanted to do? Um, there was I, I, I was practicing a little bit for the dunk contest actually in the beginning of the season. Um, you know when you know my initial thought if I made the All Star game I was going to do all the competitions I was going to do the skills the dunk contest three point contest All Star game I was going to try to put on a crazy show but um, you know the season went on obviously I didn't make it um, and I almost took it as like it's the home run derby like I didn't want to waste all my swings with the back end of the season I'm still you know I'm trying to help us get to the playoffs still and. You know, I've accomplished everything I have with dunking. Um, there's not a whole lot more I can really do or show. So why not put my hand in something else I haven't done and, you know, try to do something else. Who do you see as your stiffest competition? Like, who's you, who you got your eye on? Like, that's, I mean, that's the, the, the cat. Two, the two champions that are – so Dame, Dame is out now and Devin Booker's in and he's won it and Joe Harris has won it. So those dudes obviously know what they're doing in the competition. They've won it. So, um those are those are those are guys I'm looking out for because you know they they know their ropes around you know the, the three point contest. It's too bad you can't tell them. Uh, okay, so we're gonna change it up. We're gonna get a bunch of balls from Goodwill and we're gonna. I get, would win. We're gonna I get the pool. Automatically. <laughs> you would kill them, right? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, I've been practicing though. Um, I'm gonna probably go back tonight and get some shots up and, and work on my timing. Um, I've got the routine down. So Have you hard. talked to anybody? Have you gotten any advice on like this is the key to winning this thing? I talked to JJ Redick a little bit, um, a great three point shooter, and you know his biggest his biggest problem he said was he he's a he's an actual jump shooter, so he right. couldn't change his with the timing because he jumps in all of his shots. Um, and that takes up time to takes get up, up time. and come down. He said, he said just make sure you have a consistent rhythm and and, and make sure you, he stepped on the line a couple times when he did the three point contest. So he said just make sure you you're, you're not shooting long two pointers. Interesting. All right. Um, this, you had aspirations. You're obviously having a terrific season. Mm -hmm. Had aspirations to be an all-star. Uh, also, were not invited to the national team camp. Yeah. How are you? How are you feeling? Not having this kind of a season and not getting that kind of recognition. Oh, uh, I mean, it's a little upsetting, but it's nothing that's going to deter me from what you know I have going on. Uh, you know, I know how basketball is right now you you have to be in a almost a winning place you almost have to be averaging 30 to get in the all-star game um you know I've, you know, I'm trying to do everything we can to you know get us in the playoffs I know personally there isn't 12 better players than me having a better season than me in the east but you know there's you know something else you can do with that I appreciate you though <laughs> I just you know I just know that but um yeah you know with the oh, I appreciate you. with the uh with the USA selection I, I actually um I was a little confused about that, but I think they wanted to go with people who have already been a part of the USA um, culture. You know, they've, they've left a lot of guys off there, like CJ McCollum and Trey Young and different True. guys like that. So, um, you know, obviously I want to be a part of everything. I'm a competitor. You right. know, I want to put my name in it. And, you know, obviously I think I stack up pretty well. I play against these guys, you know, all the time. So, um, just, you know, I, you can add a little bit more fuel to the fire, but it's not going to stop me or what I'm going to do Continue. Do you, uh, we talked about sort of the, the impression of you being just a dunker and wanting to, to, to shift that narrative. Do you think there are any other preconceived notions about you that you've had to battle uh, that, or maybe that you're trying to change the perspective, not necessarily from a public standpoint, but from within the league or within co with, with coaches, other teams? Um, I think the main thing is I, have, I haven't, been on a winning team and you know coming from minnesota is you know i was drafted into a rebuilding organization um we started getting better got traded here we started rebuilding again and you know i have to prove myself as a winner and and, and be try to be at the forefront of that um uh, you know continuing now we're in the playoff push we still have to be a lot more consistent you know i think we're, we're a lot better than what our records you know speaks for we just have to be a lot more consistent going to third quarter fourth quarters and you know, you never know what can happen. We put a string together. We can we can get into that seventh eighth spot. But uh, you know, going forward, I want to you know I want to be known as a winner, and you know that's that's pretty much what I do it for. Uh, six seasons, five coaches. Mm -hmm. I have that right. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what he's talking about. Yeah. Now, I'm thinking for, for all of you out yeah. here, imagine uh, where, wherever you work, you've been working there for six years and you've had five different bosses. Like, you'd be thinking, why the hell am I doing this? Like, yeah. what, what, what's up with this business, right? Yeah. Uh, what? And I, I guess you don't have anything to compare it to, but, mm. but give us a sense of what that's like for you at this stage, having that constant, being two different places and having that constant turnover in terms of who's running the show. It's, it was a little weird because, you know, it's out of your control. Um, you know, starting with, obviously, Flip Sonner is the one that drafted me. You know, rest in peace to him. You know, a tragic, you know, incident would happen with him. And uh, Sam Mitchell took over for him. Um, they Timberwolves didn't stick with him. Then they got Tibbs. I know you guys know Tibbs, and he was in Minnesota. Um, I got traded here, and it was Fred. Hmm. Um, they wanted to switch it up, and now it's Jim. So, um, you know, you have to you have to adjust. It's the it's the professional. You you have to still go out there and do your job. Nobody's gonna feel sorry for you. Um, you know, I think the main thing is just trying to get that that continuity and in that connection. You know, because right. it's a different offense. It's a different defense. It's you know, it's a different personality each time. So um, you have to be you have to be uh, flexible. I think that's where where players are often done an injustice in that you have these dramatic changes. And I feel like this might have been occurred to you. So Tibbs comes in there and for whatever reason, you end up not staying there. And so you don't have that Tibbs stamp of approval. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then it's suddenly, oh, he doesn't meet. Tibbs' expectations. There must be something wrong with him, yeah, right? Yeah. And it's not. Isn't is is it can be a narrative for so many different things. But you know, obviously, you know, when I when I got traded, I had the ACL injury. You know, and they wanted to go a different direction. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunate, but um, you know, me and Tibbs were actually really cool. I actually really respect him as a coach. Hmm. Um, he gave me a big time opportunity going into my third year. He, I was averaging the most minutes in the league at the time. Um, you know, I was playing like 38 minutes a game. At one point, me, Andrew, and Carl were all averaging over 21 points a game. So I think if I would have finished out that season, we would have been the first trio of players under 20 or 21 or under to average 20 points a game. It was, we, were, we were doing pretty good. Look at you with the analytics. I mean, I know my stuff now. So. <laughs> <laughs> the, you had to take over as the not just the go-to scorer on this team, but, but a leader as well. And this is a proud franchise trying to get back to the heights. What has been the biggest challenge in embracing that for the first time? I started a little bit last year. Um, you know, I've always I've always been a leader in in, in my own way, uh, and I think that's the biggest thing. You you can't be a leader and try to be like oh, I'm gonna be like him. I'm gonna be like him. You have to be yourself, or people can see through that. It's gonna come out if it's fake. Um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm an extremely hard worker. Um, I try to let that speak for itself on and off the court. But then when I do say something, I think, you know, it, it carries weight, you know, because it's not going to be, you know, I'm not a rah-rah guy that's going to just continue to be chirping throughout the locker room saying a bunch of empty things, you know. When I do say something, you know, it's, it's, it's meaningful. So, um, you know, you have to be yourself. And, you know, you have to, as a leader, you have to look at yourself first. And okay, Am I doing everything right? Am I coming to practice? Am you know, am I doing all the right things, um, good or bad? I'm going to be the one that, you know, has to take the brunt of this, and you have to be okay with that. Yeah. I, in talking about your, your background, uh, it's clear how grounded you are and the humble be beginnings that you came from and the lessons that you learned. And I, but I get the sense that people look at you as an NBA player. They look at the contract or they look at the flash and they look at all that, and they don't, see the person do you how do you deal with that because i'm sure you run up against it in the way people approach you yeah i mean because it's um it's their one time seeing you and that i feel like for people of you know that are athletes or, or at a higher status in, in in sports you know it's their one time seeing you so it, you, you're looked at in a different light and not looked at as a person still um you know, at the end of the day i'm a basketball player but i'm just like you guys you know I, I, I can just put the ball in the hoop, you know. I'm a, I go home, I watch movies, I play video games, you know. I'm a big family person. I love spending time with my family, my dogs, you know. it's, But, uh, you know, it's tough, you know, because they, they look at you as, you know, 
almost like uh, how I seen it a couple of times as like a, it's a zoo animal, um, you know, you in the cage, they do this, you know, do a dunk or, you know, sign this and mm. do that. But, mm. you know, you still, you know, you're still a person at the end of the day, but you have to understand where you are. And, you know, that one time it might be a little kid. This might be the one time he sees you and it might be, you know, you might change your life by just signing an autograph because, to, you know, to him, you, you're something bigger than just, you know, a regular person. Who gave you that? awareness and who keeps you on track if you if you lose sight of that is that family too or is there somebody I think I think my mom and my dad instilled that in me as a young age but I think I started realizing it when I was when I was younger how I looked at you know the Kobe Bryant's and the people I looked up to how I looked at them is how these younger kids are looking at me and I remember that feeling I had when you know um I mean, I was younger. I actually, I'll tell a story. I modeled when I was younger. Um, I did this little modeling clear when I was younger, and I was like in. All right, we need some details on grade. this. I want to, I want to hear this I, story. I, so, I did what were you modeling? modeling. I, I, I used to do like little things. I was on a Gatorade commercial when I was younger and things like that. Um, and, you know, poses, different things. But uh, I remember I met uh, some rappers. Um, who was it? Who was the rappers I met? It was like juvenile, juvenile cash money. It was back in the 2000s, okay. but uh, you know, I met them and I just remember I was like, hey, how you doing, Zach Levine? You know, da da da. I have a picture, and they're like, no. And, you know, they had something to do, move, keep it move, but it was just like, dang, that was the one time I got to see them. And I remember how that felt when I was a little kid. So, you know, I didn't want to. Now that I'm in that position, make them feel that way. Yeah, that's good stuff. By the way, I was just thinking about the the uh, the five coaches in six years. Reggie Miller didn't have to go through that, but he told me the story about Larry Brown would change their playbook like three, three or four times during the course of a season. So he would, he would call a play, and Reggie would leave the, leave the huddle to go out on the floor, and he'd say, okay, wait a minute, is that the old two play, or is that the new two play, or is that the which pl two play was that? Yeah. Did you ever do you ever run into that with all those different coaches, all those different sets where like there's a play call and you're like, okay, which, which one which one is this? So literally, I I have that problem every once in a while still. Um, with T with Tibbs, we we drill defense like night and day when I was in Minnesota. Um, so wake up defense, go to sleep defense. You know you, you everything. You don't even watch half the offensive film. Throw it out the window. We're watching an hour of defensive film. <laughs> So, you know, the terminology for us was ice was when a pick and roll happens, you send it to the baseline. You, you don't allow anything to the middle. So when I got here, hmm. automatically in my mind, all my defensive coverage is ice now. So they were getting mad at me for the first, like, three weeks. I'm automatically, you know, and it's a defensive scheme in the NBA. I'm icing everything. You right. know, I'm keeping everything on the left side of the floor. So uh, every once in a while I still have a Tibbs voice in my head, you know, yelling ice. But... You know, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm I'm a lot better with it now after I've you know got away from it. <laughs> Biggest misconception about you as a player? Biggest misconception? Um, I mean, obviously, I think it'd have to be just you know he's an athlete. I think that's the main thing. Um, you know, you can't go out and I think people get pigeonholed in that. Like you said, there's the Vince Cars and the Dominiques who are. I think are future Hall of Famers, but you guys first thing you think of is their highlights and their dunks. But you know, Vince Carter over you know twenty thousand points, Dominique over twenty thousand points. You can't do that by just dunking the ball. Yeah. You know, these are spectacular basketball players. So, um, you know, I think the same thing with me. Um, you know, I I, I I take pride in my dunking and my athleticism has helped me in my game. It's got me to this point, but it's not who I am. It's not you know anything close to the basketball player I am. I'll give you two that I find myself, because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Zach Levine advocate now. I don't know if you guys have, you hear me on, you you hear me on any of my platforms. No, I wasn't a hater before. I wasn't a hater message. before. I just, I'm an advocate now, and I'm running into some interference. Yeah. Like, I'm being, Brian Scalabrini will okay. challenge me all the time. He goes, yeah. are you somehow related to Zach Levine? I'm like, no, I just, I, I know what the guy's about and now. I think that's what people have to understand. They have to get to know you. 100%. Yeah. So the first one is, that you're not, uh, you're not all in defensively, okay. and I've said, yeah, you know what, you can see that. 
Yeah. Okay. I see that. Because I think you've improved. I'm trying massively. my ass off. Well, yeah. and that, <laughs> and that to me is the biggest. I mean, people would kill Steve Nash. Yeah. But, and I'd say everybody gets beat one on one. Yeah. It's a matter of whether you stay beat. Yeah. It's whether you are and are you trying to change anything about how you're doing it, and are you staying within the game plan? When, when I mean, this is the NBA, you're going to get beat defensively. Somebody's going to score on you. Um, the good thing about me, or and I can't say good thing, I've always been such a competitional person. One on one has never been the problem with me. I've always been able athletically to stay in front of my man and guard him. I've always been the dude uh, where it's team defense, where it's the dude on the weak side, and I'm locked into my guy, and I don't get to the rotation, or I'm focused on, I'm trying to get this. this by the way, I am top 10 in steals in the NBA this year, but. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm worried about getting a steal when I should be helping the back door cut type thing. So, right. um, you know, I, I can see how you get pigeon on that, but I appreciate you looking out for me. Doing what I can. <laughs> the other one is, and knowing you and your devotion to getting the Bulls to where everybody wants them to be, is your uh, your passion and your competitive fire. I think there's a smoothness to your game, and you don't, you're not a KG, a motor, shall we say? Yeah. That people have that impression like, he's, uh, he's, a, little, he's a little nonchalant, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, I can see that, and that's, I think that's, um, that's a good point, I never thought of that. Um, <laughs> because you can't, you can't tell somebody to show emotion when, not, when they're not an extremely emotional player. You know, I, I'll do anything to, you know, on the court to win, you know, and I, I lace up my shoes, and like I said, I'm not intimidated by anybody. I'm, I'm going out there. I'll play through injuries. You know, I'll pop up and, you know, I'll defend my teammates. I'll do whatever I got to do to win. But you might not get that same type of, you know, KG facial, you know, spit in your face type thing. But, you know, I'm a killer in my same way. Right. Uh, what's the next step for you as a player? What's the next thing that you want to add or improve on or – I mean, each year I go in um, at the end of the year and I evaluate how I did, you know, the things I did well and the things I didn't do well. Um, and I, I've always said I'm, I'm my biggest critic and then my dad is as well. You know, I've, I've had games. Yeah, my dad still calls me. I'm 24, 25 years old, you know, a solidified player in the NBA. My dad called me and told me what I was doing wrong in the game. So, <laughs> you know, I've had 40 in the game. He told me I should have, you know, you should have did this and this. So, um I think the biggest thing now is, you know, I, I want to get to the playoffs. I want to help to help a team win, yeah. and you know, I'm doing everything in my power to try to do that. And you know, we still have 27 games left. Um, 27, yeah, 27 games left, and just making sure, you know, going into the second half of the season, making sure everybody hasn't gone on vacation early. You know, and you know, you have to still believe that we have a chance. So, when does Dad text? Does he call? And do you, like, when you go to the locker room after a game, are you checking the phone to yeah. see? No, nah, he don't call me or nothing during the games. But, uh, you know, afterwards, I might get I might get a FaceTime or something like that. Before, he never used to FaceTime, and we start showing him that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll give me a text, and then, or, I'll, or I'll get a FaceTime, and, you know. I'll see, I'll see, uh, I'll see just like a, like a black screen, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, bro, what you doing? Phone in his pocket or something like that. You know. <laughs> and, and where's, where's mom in this equation? Like what, what? Right, right next to him saying, hi, honey, good game. And, you know, <laughs> I hear her every once in a while in the background, but I, I call her, you know, just to, you know, she, she makes my day. She makes me feel better. So I call her just to see how she's doing and checking in and, uh, you know, she's taking care of the dogs and she's taking care of my dad. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a challenging song. How do, you, how do you deal with friends, family, people around you that bring a certain negative energy in terms of, hey, dog, you're not getting what you deserve, or like you should be doing this or they should be doing this for you? Because I, I, I've seen that with plenty of guys. And I don't see that with you, and so I wonder how you whether whether it's there and you combat it, or you simply have surrounded yourself with people who don't who don't present that to you. I mean, everybody in their own camp or their own team is going to have that because they're going to be. It's it's always going to be on your side. You're never at fault. Um, mm. You know, as the player, you have to look at yourself and be like, you know how is this going to help me? Because this is going to affect me negatively on the team because now I'm going in with the wrong mindset. Um, 
you know, I think I've always had a small circle. I've had the same three, four friends since I was in high school. I've been dating my girlfriend since I was in high school. Um, so it's been it's been the same, you know, group of guys. They all play basketball. Um, you know, my father and the boys I grew up with. But, you know, there's always that negativity and there don't be in your ear every once in a while for things because, you know, they love and care about you and they want the best for you. And, um, you know, but as, but you as the person, as the, you know, as the player, as the athlete, you have to, you know, almost assess it as, you know, is this, is this true or is this them just trying to be on my side, making sure that, you know, I'm not at fault. And sometimes you are at fault. You have to, you know, be, you know come to realization of that. Who can you count on to tell you the truth? Um, my dad, yeah, yeah, for sure. Man, my dad, for sure. Um, you know, he told me right from wrong all the time. You know, um, if I say something wrong in the media, if I, if I, you know, if I approach the situation wrong, you know, I think I'm right. You, you know, I'm, like, I'm a grown man. I'm 25, and he's still, you know, he's still keep giving me lessons. I appreciate it. By the way, you, the, uh, all those details about being a homebody and all that is going to kill your nickname, Young Hollywood. That, that, that's, that was see that, that was in high school when I went to when I went to UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that was that, that was a cool nickname for a while. But yeah, man, I'm not I'm not Young Hollywood anymore. <laughs> who 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 gave that to you and how did you earn it? Kyle Anderson actually gave that to is me. Is that right? Yeah, Kyle Anderson gave it to me. Well, that's it was, it was slow mo. My, it was my gamer tag for my video games for a while too, man. I, <laughs> young Hollywood, yeah. Damn, I haven't heard that in a while. <laughs> Do you have any? I've I haven't heard any others. You, are there any other? I never had a bit a lot of nicknames. I never was a. Uh, I don't think a nickname person. You know, yeah. A lot of my family and my dad called me Z, but that's you know that's about it. So standard. Yeah, easy. All right, you've talked about with this Bulls team, and we'll start to wrap this up. Um, in spite of the way things have gone, well, let's 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 just start there. When you look at where you are and where you expect it to be, what do you think has been the number one reason that you guys find yourself where you are right now? The number one thing um, where we are right now, I'd have to say, you know, it's it's close. I'd have to say injuries because that 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 definitely hurts us. Um, you know. With Lowry being out, Otto being out, um, you know, even Chris being out, you know, it's hard with the NBA now. It's hard to, you know, sustain, you know, consistency with that, you know, with with three big pieces out. Wendell's out right now too. Like we we've hit the injury bug pretty hard for the last couple of years. Um, but even with that, you know, we've been in a lot of games, um, and our consistency and our I think you know, our alertness to, you know, take over a game when, you know, we might go into the third quarter, we might be leading, and this is against teams that, you know, are above 500. This is playoff teams. We, we've been playing with a lot of teams, and we'll we'll hit a wall, and we, we're not able to come back. We'll, 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 we'll make it a game at the end. We'll try to fight. You know, we might come, you know, be, be back down by 10, but we don't have enough to finish it out. So, um I'll definitely say it's a little bit of injuries, but it's a little bit of us as well, um, not knowing the moment and, and, and taking control of the game because when opportunity knocks, you got, you got to open the door. We've seen you as the, as the closer, had some situations where you weren't successful, others that you, you have been. What is it that you've learned about being in those situations from both sides of that? What didn't work and what did work that – you, you may not have known not having been in that situation consistently prior. Yeah. Um, you know, I've always been somebody that's – I've never been scared to take take a big shot or I haven't been scared to miss either. Um, you're not going to hit all your shots. You're not going to – you're not going to be a thousand percent. And, you know, I think growing up and having that chip on my shoulder and um, being being a confident person, you have to you have to have that in you a little bit. Um, but I think you, you know, it's, you have to take the good with the bad, you know, some nights you're going to miss, some nights you're going to make them. You have to evaluate, did you make the right play though? And, you know, if it's the right shot, if you just missed the shot, then it's like, Hey, you know, I try, um, you know, obviously you're not, no one's going out there to, you know, to miss a game winner. So, um, you know, and then when you do make it, you know, you obviously, you, you, 
you know, you're happy for it, but it's, you know, it's just another step in the right direction. So you have to take the good with the bad. Um, you know, I'm okay with the scrutiny or, you know, or the praise. You know, I can take that, but I have to evaluate on myself as if I made the right play. You're, I was just thinking about, we, we talked about this uh, beforehand, uh, all-star break is supposed to be a break. Yeah. No, it's You're not. here yeah. doing this, no. doing a variety of things. Yeah. How do you... How do you mentally recharge? And do you feel like you need to find a pocket in this period to recharge for that last that last push? Oh yeah, for for sure. Um, you know, this is my third All Star Weekend. You know, I've been you know a part of. Um, you know, I woke up today at like nine o'clock. I did the NBA media, and I'm here. I got a jam packed day for today and tomorrow. So. You know, they do, it seems like a break, but it really isn't. Um, You'd rather be practicing, right? It'd be it's it's way it, no, 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 I didn't say this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's more of a you know you can you can take some you can take some time. You get off you know you get off your feet a little bit. Yeah. You know, it's still exhausting. You know, being able to go out there, you have to you know do a different events, but um, you know, it's still it's fun to be a part of these festivities. Um, you know, you're not uh, at one point. I'm not going to be able to do this, so. You have to, you know, you have to look at it that way as well. So I'll find some time to recharge, um, you know, get a couple massages and be ready to go. You still believe that this team, you made, you made it a point, the team made it a point that uh, competing for a playoff spot was a goal at the beginning of the year. I get the sense you still see that as a, a possibility. What has to happen between now and the end of the season other than win games, obviously, yeah. uh, what 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 has what does this team have to do to be able to accomplish that? I mean, well, there's no more time to waste. It's uh, you know, you have to go in thinking that there is a chance to, you know, I haven't given up, and you know, I think we're talking about this, and you know, in the room is, you know, I think everybody has to be on the same page. People can't be, you know, pulling in different directions. Um, you know, this is the time where teams can either, you know, go up or go down by, you know, their their focus, you know, coming back after All-Star break in. Uh, you know, I know me personally, I'm ready to go. I go into every game thinking we can win. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a confident person, but I'm not, you know, I'm not naive as well. I know that the, you know, the time's clicking, you know, on our time to, you know, get to the playoffs and we have to start, you know, from the jump and we still have time to do it, so. Uh, you know, hopefully when we come back, we can get the, you know, our, my, our right mindset and, you know, make a push for this thing. Big picture. What is it that you want to accomplish as a player? What, what, is, what is the thing that, would, that you view as, you know what, this, this would make my career complete if I can get this done, or this is how I want people to view who Zach Levine was as an NBA player? And I know um, that's kind of two questions, but no, that's fine. I mean, obviously, I think any I think any basketball player you know wants to get to the mountaintop as a team, you know, to win a championship. It's 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 pretty easy and simple. But you know, as a player, you know, right now where I am, I haven't got to the playoffs. So for me, I want to help this Bulls organization get back to where you know we're in contention, fighting for a championship. I want to you know we've been in the rebuilding process. I want to be you know at the forefront of helping us get back there. We've gone through some, you know, some down years now. You know, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to make sure I'm here to, you know, help bring this back to light. Um, you know, because with winning comes, you know, success individually. And I, that's what I've realized over the last, you know, four years of my career is the better you are as a team, the better you're viewed as well. You know, it doesn't matter if you're going out there averaging 30 points a game, you know, you don't still be viewed as, you know, lesser. So, you know, with winning comes, you know, comes, you know, everybody, everybody eats from it, you know, from the, from the top down. So, uh, you know, I won't be a winning player. I don't know that, uh, that the Bulls could have anybody uh, that I think is better suited for taking them there and uh, from what I've gotten to know about you. And so very much pulling for you to make that happen and for, for the Bulls to make that happen as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Zach Levine. Yeah. Thanks so much, that was awesome. No, thank you. Thank you.